hope you guys see if you guys can hear me okay. Sorry, that took a long time to go on. <clears throat> I know I said I was going to do this a while ago. Oh, let me fix my... So, this stream is going to be the first of several... It's just kind of like an ongoing project that I want to... That I want to begin. Um, hey, Abel, how are you? Hey, good. I'm glad it's good. Thank you. Thanks for confirming. Um, so, I hope you guys can, like, understand me. My voice is just so shot out. I want to work on, in, like, an investigative reporting piece um, that I think will be ongoing. And I want to accomplish several things. First, I want to look at Newcastle Youth Development Center, which is a juvenile correction center that was closed down in 2013 for a variety of reasons. Hey, Rana, um, not limited to abuse allegations, lawsuit after lawsuit, and I guess the official reasoning is lack of state funding, but really it's because of the amount of lawsuits that were brought forward. Abel says, I'm finally doing better. I'm finally free from my surgery. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad you're feeling better. Good. Then you can put that whole thing behind you. So I want to look at this youth developmental center. It was closed down in 2013 in western Pennsylvania, Newcastle, as sort of a, um, like a case study to look at what, What's going on in these youth developmental centers? What is happening to at-risk youth? Um, how is it happening? Why is it happening? And what are the red flags? How can we stop it? Um, so my best friend lives with me, and her and my boyfriend have really similar stories. I guess I'm just like a child, like just drawn to a certain type of person because it's like my best friend and my boyfriend are like two sides of the same coin. They both grew up in foster care. They both had mothers who were highly addicted, who had a, a range of mental health issues, um, who were unfit parents and both of whom tried to kill <laughs> my best friend and then my boyfriend. Um, and so I talked to my best friend who lives with me and she's gonna come on and I'm gonna interview her because she has her own story of sexual abuse that happened in a program called um, Outward Bound. That it was like all of the kids I remember in high school that had like trouble, who got in trouble, who were having issues were sent out to this program. It was like anybody who watches Dr. Phil, you know, they say like send her to the ranch, turnabout ranch. It's similar to something like that, but it's what we have in Pennsylvania. I want to look at this situation as, you know, sort of a personal project to protect somebody that I love and to sort of bring justice to a situation um, and hopefully bring closure to um, a situation that impacted somebody that I care about very much during their childhood. Um, and at the same time, I, I, you know, so there's going to be like a personal side of it. But also, I want to talk about, again, how can we identify this sort of stuff? You know, what... What do we need to know about the sorts of people who commit these kinds of crimes and, you know, what can be done? And I hope that, you know, I would love it if people from Newcastle found out about this stream and wanted to get in touch with me, talk to me about their own experiences. I also want to find a way to bring justice to the two women who were allegedly sexually abusing my boyfriend when he was a child, when he was a youth, 
at one of these state-run facilities. Hey, Samantha. Um, and I have to be really careful and thoughtful and cautious and calculated with how I go about this. Because obviously, you know, we have a checks and balances. Obviously, you can't just make allegations and accusations about somebody. It's why, you know, I haven't named who they are. I've done a lot of research. I know a lot about both women now. I've been in contact with both women. Um, I have a trans, I can transcribe basically the conversation that I had with both. Um, but I need to be cautious because I don't. I want to figure out the right way to go about this. I've already been in contact with um, a lawyer. Um, but the difficult thing, sorry, I'm like having bad hot flashes. The difficult thing is the fact that the statute of limitations might be an issue, right? And so one way around statute of limitations obviously you know there's probably nothing we can do on a criminal level so it's likely I'm not gonna be able to get justice through the criminal courts unless there's some sort of loophole I haven't considered um, on a civil level I'm also not sure but I can one way, a loophole for survivors or victims of childhood sexual abuse to get justice when all of the statute of limitations have run out. It's like a weird kind of roundabout way to do it. Is to almost invite a defamation lawsuit. Um, because... The one single full defense against defamation is that you're telling the truth. So if someone brings a lawsuit and it turns out that you're telling the truth, that could backfire in a major way against the person bringing the defamation lawsuit. And it's a way to bring to light facts in open court against an abuser brought by a victim for whom statutes of limitations have run out. But obviously, it's, you, it's, you've got to be really cautious about it. But ultimately, you almost want to invite a defamation lawsuit because then you go and you bring all the information you have and all of the evidence, and um, and then you can win. And you can have something, a record, in open court, basically proving that abuse did take place. And then because that becomes public record, that can be used. It is then legitimate. It is not slanderous. It's not libelous to take that and use it to notify their employer, notify whoever else. Because the fact of the matter is, is that one of these women is still working with children. And the other one is, I think, working in some capacity that potentially intersects with children. And that's a problem. Um, telling the truth, or at least you made a good faith effort to do research and attempt to be honest. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. And so, obviously, I'm not going to drop any names until I have, like, the... First and foremost, he's telling the truth. And I know that because he has given me, and this is over past five years he's been telling me this, so many details that have basically been corroborated. And there's witnesses. We have, like, family witnesses and friends who kind of knew what was going on. Um, one of the women, after he had, like, left, graduated out of the facility, both of them try to maintain a relationship with him. There's money transfers. There's hotel stays. There's communications. There's a cell phone. There's a lot. There's a lot that I've already seen. And I'm already fully satisfied that 
Like, and I just, I know this person, but I know that, like, me just saying, oh, I know him and he's not lying is not going to be good enough to convince anybody else. So, you know, I you need more than that. So, first and foremost, I want to take a look. I've been going through uh, Newcastle Youth Development um, Center and just kind of, like, really going through the history of their lawsuits and it's interesting because there was a huge scandal with Newcastle Youth Development Center long back when they were open. They shut down in 2013. But they had a scandal where there was a judge who was receiving kickbacks, financial kickbacks. Hey, Sasha. Hey, Andy Music Lover. Who was receiving financial kickbacks for sentencing youth. And sentencing them to this facility. It was a huge scandal. Kids' lives were ruined. They, children were removed from their families. Children were adjudicated delinquent. All for financial and profit-driven motive that was highly corrupt. Obviously, this judge was removed from the bench, and disbarred, and, and I think even faced charges. And, and a lot of cases were thrown out, but not before the damage had been done. You know what the crazy thing is? When you Google this youth development center, that, that all of that information used to be the first thing that came up. It's no longer. Now, like, the first hit is the fact that there is, like, a land dispute over what to do with the property that the development center that still exists but is all just boarded up and shut down. Well, what to do with that property? And, like, it's some bullshit. It's so crazy how much, you know, that information has been kind of buried. But um, I did find, let me pull it up, I did find an audit that was done uh, of the Youth Development Center. Hold on, let me put... Um, okay, so I did find this audit that was done. Thanks, Rana. They're my daughter's bows. <laughs> I stole them from her. Mm -mm. All right. So first I want to go through this audit, and then I want to go through his story. Somebody had asked me if I have permission to tell my boyfriend's story. Um, yes, and I have it in writing if it makes anyone feel better. But I have full permission to tell his story. He trusts me. I, like, he's my best friend. You know what I mean? Like, I would never do anything without his permission. If it was harmful to him, he's, he's my, like, he's my best friend. I'm, trust me, like, everything we do, like, we're in it together. So he knows what's going on, but I do have, I asked him for written permission just so that nobody, you know, was concerned about that. Samantha says, it's very sad it took this long for someone to stand up for your boyfriend. It is really sad because, you know what, he's not, he's not what you would consider, you know, a real sympathetic person. You know, it's like he was a big kid. He is, you know, he's biracial, a black kid from the inner city. His mom was addicted to crack. He had no family, nothing, you know, no one, no, no competent family to stand up for him. His father was in prison. Um, his family was really poor. And every, you know, and he even said, he said for a long time, I thought it was cool that this had happened or I, I didn't think that I was really a victim because I felt like I, couldn't be a victim because I was male and I kind of felt like it was my fault for like I don't know just just going along with it and he's like I, I it wasn't until I was older that I really realized how much it really did have an impact on my like mental health and my just well-being my understanding of like healthy sexual relationships my understanding of just healthy relationships period he was like you know I really feel like I was looking for like a mother figure like a maternal person in my life and they used that you know that I really was like just so he was so he's still that way he's so sweet he's just so like I know him 
just desperate for that kind of like maternal love and like he, he reached out to them and they took it as a sign of like him coming on to them he was like listen he's i think he's really sexy you know and so he's always a beautiful kid he was always just a beautiful person um and I guess once he kind of went through puberty, like he, I've seen pictures of him when he was 14. He looked like an adult. But that's not an excuse. I looked like an adult. Let me show, I'll show you a picture of what I looked like. And I'll show you a picture of what he looked like. Just because we looked like adults doesn't mean we were them. And I had the same issues. I had issues as a kid of like a men coming after me a lot. A lot. And um, it, it didn't, it wasn't acceptable. So just because you look like an adult doesn't mean you are one. I'm so hot. Uh, Ron says, I trust you and I believe you. I'm so sorry to hear that this happened to your boyfriend and so many other kids. I am really sad too. And thank you. I, thank you. Um, I just, I don't look, I, I, I like my heart sunk when I saw that one of these women in particular is still working with kids. And I talked to her on the phone. And I was like, I see, I could, like, you're still working with children? She goes, yes, you know, I've been working with children for 30 plus year or 25 plus years and I and I like I just got quiet for a second and I was like well that's about to change it might not be tomorrow but that's about to change and like she got really weird I talked to both of them on the phone I was like my heart was racing but I just stayed calm and I talked to them um so let's go through well, let me just see if I have a picture of like Oh, yeah. All right, here's a picture of me when I was 14. And I just show this just to say that, like, that I did look really mature as a kid. And it doesn't mean that I was mature, you know. And he was the same way. And he and I are only five months apart. It's just crazy because I always think about, like, what if I my paths had crossed with you back then, what it would have been like. Um, I don't know what it went. Hold on, let's see. So, okay, here we go. Uh, all right, so let's see. Um, and I'll get some of his pictures too. I think I have them somewhere else, but I have this one. Uh, uh, uh. And well, so. So, like, that's what I looked like as a kid. Like, I was just, like, me and my friend were, like, kidding around. To, I was, like, 13 in this picture, right? I looked like an adult. I, I mean, I did. I was really tall, and, like, I, like, tried to act like I was mature. Just because I looked, like, a lot older than I was, and just because he looked a lot older than he was, and just because maybe we had hormones... And, you know, we were interested in sex. Like, doesn't mean it's okay for adults to take advantage of that. You know, it's normal and it's appropriate and it's healthy for kids of the same age to explore sex and sexuality together. It's not okay when you're in a teacher in an institution for children, disenfranchised children who don't have families. How dare you? How dare you abuse that situation? Um, Orwell's House Cat says, This book is invaluable. Uh, Michelle Elliott, Female Sexual Abuse of Children. I'll, I'll pin that. Um, it just makes me so mad. It really makes me mad. Because it's like he wasn't reaching out to them for sex. He was reaching out to them for a sense of security, of stability to help him finish school and feel safe 
And it's like you people violated it. And those were so that was his first his first experience with like a real sexual relationship were these two fucking women. These two scumbag women in their mid fifties. Ew, he said the one smelled like cheap perfume and cigarettes and was like she was like I wasn't attracted to her. He was like, it used to gross me out, honestly, but I just, like, I don't know. She used to always, like, do stuff for me, and then I felt like I would get in trouble if I didn't go. These people are in a position of power, and they abuse that. It, it makes me so fucking mad. Oh, God, I'm talking to them. Anyway. So. Hold on. And I, I'm like, I'm so glad that my girlfriend said that she'll also come on here and talk with us about whatever's going on. And it's just, it's like also emotional for me because like I had fucked up stuff. I, I like when I was 15, I had like a relationship with some like 45 year old. It was fucking disgusting. It was fucking disgusting now that I think about it. He would like take me to the mall. And, like, buy me outfits and stuff. It's just sick. Um, let's find out. They sound like Selma and Patty. The sisters from... No, really. That, that you're, you're absolutely right. Ew, and the one, like, went and got married. Ew, ew, ew. And one of them, he said that her husband started to, like, catch on that something was going on was in, and, like, getting jealous. And he, he said that... He, like, her husband, like, pulled up to the, like, youth development center, like, on his motorcycle to, like, see what was going on. Like, what were you going to do? Like, fight him, you fucking losers? You should have exposed your wife. Like, rather than, and then, then, like, the two women started to, like, catch on to each other. That, like, they were both seeing the same kid. And then they were, like, fighting, kind of, and being, like, petty towards each other and, like, 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 competing for him. All right, anyway, so Youth Development Center at Newcastle. It was shut down in 2013 because it was, like, scandal-ridden. So this is an audit that was taken between July 1st of 2007, January 26, 2010. Okay, so this is by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare. Okay, so it says... This was on August 4th, 2011. And this is probably what like led up to it being shut down because this, this audit was like abysmal. The Honorable Tom Corbett, I remember him. So when he was our governor, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg. Dear Governor Corbett, this report contains the results of a performance audit of the Youth Development Center at Newcastle of the Department of Public Welfare from July 1st, 2007 to January 26, 2010. The audit was conducted under the authority provided to Section 402 of the Fiscal Code and in accordance with generally accepted government auditing standards. The report details the audit objectives, scope, methodology, finding, and recommendations. The report indicates that the Youth Development Center in Newcastle did not take adequate measures to minimize employee injuries or effectively address repeated allegations of abuse. Moreover, the facility's abuse Investigations and reports were not always timely or comprehensive. The report notes deficiencies in the facility's supervisory coverage, employee screening procedures, and records management. Finally, the facility did not maintain a board of trustees, an unresolved finding from our prior order. So basically, they were told to get a board of trustees together, and they never did it, which is also like a huge problem. And this is the state-run facility. It just makes me so mad because it's like, I just think, like, they wasted his time. When he could have been, like, healing from, like, his life. And, like, getting ready to, like, be out in the world or, like, finish school and be healthy and, and cultivate himself as a human being, as a young adult. You know, moving from, like, childhood into, you know, his young adult life. He could have been focusing on developing himself. Instead, he was fucking dealing with both of these women and their jealousy. And they're like, 
emotions and and once he said would get real jealous and would like grab him by the neck if he ever talked to anybody else and like would like get like real psychotic and jealous and like tell him that he wasn't allowed to talk to anybody and they were always like tell it like you know sending him to like fetching for him and telling him to come up to their office and one of them was like giving him alcohol him and his friend alcohol and they were drinking in there as kids you're supposed to be protecting these kids you piece of fucking shit um so they weren't in it together it was a coincidence that both of those women were trying to I, uh, I I I just I think it's just I so it's funny because I was talking to my girlfriend um I was talking to my girlfriend who lives with me and I said we were just having a long talk about it when I was asking her if she would come on and she was like you know I don't know that these people start off with bad intentions she was like just from my experience with my abuse I really feel like that they don't come to it thinking I'm going to abuse kids. She said, I think what happens is, and this is, you know, she was like, I don't know this is for everybody, but she goes, I think overall what happens is it's the environment and these women and men start getting, you know, there's, there's just like a lack of boundaries and they, they're there for a long time. Their own boundaries come down. And the fact that a lot of the kids, the older kids do start to look like adults And there just becomes like these deep kind of, you know, interpersonal relationships. And, you know, these the people who work there end up taking on these like intense, like kind of emotional relationships with these kids because these kids don't have parents and they're, they're, you know, inappropriately, they have inappropriate attachment styles and other things like that. And she thinks, she was like, I think over time, somebody who maybe started off with all the best of intentions starts to let their guard down. And then starts to, like, move into, like, inappropriate behavior. And it becomes just, like, a slippery slope. And I will say about my boyfriend as a kid, I can see him. He's the type of kid, he's so affectionate. And he's so eager to please. And he comes, this is why I was, like, really, like, skeptical of him when I first met him. Because he's so nice and he's so charming. And I was kind of like, all right, like, what do you, I, like, no one's that nice. No one's that, like, sweet and charming. And it's like, I just kind of was like, okay, you probably are, like, a cheater or have a bunch of girlfriends or, you know, you, like, hook people in by being real charismatic. He's just popular, like, real charismatic. And I think what it was is, like, as a kid, he was just so eager to please and so... And then I, I realized later that he is authentically like that. He is a genuine person. Um, but I, I think that, be, you know, and and again, because he didn't have parents. And you know what I also think? Because he is a victim of, like, severe childhood sexual abuse from when he was very little. So he was, like, five when his like first real sexual abuse started happening. So I think his boundaries were already fucked up, you know? And I think that he already had a, just a warped understanding of what's appropriate with adults. And he had had these experiences with adults before. So he didn't have boundaries. They didn't have boundaries. He was so like affectionate and they just, I, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure he was her horny. You know, he was like, I think as he was being like at 13, 14, a lot of kids are going through a lot of, you know, hormones and stuff like that. And where adults have a responsibility to put a boundary down, you know, these women would just like, uh, were so desperate for attention or validation in their own lives or weren't happy with their own husbands and stuff. So I, you know... I don't know. I really don't know how this stuff happens. See, uh, Lucid Vulture says, I'm late. Wi-Fi is slow, but I feel for him. I was not raised privileged, not a lack of a safety net. People are sick and evil and will not hesitate to exploit innocent, vulnerable people. Exactly. And that's what my girlfriend said. She was like, Britt, when these social workers see, they can see the visit log. They know who has parents who call in every day. They know who's getting visits every week. They know which kids always have family coming. 
during like the big family days and they know which kids don't. They know which kids don't have anybody. She's like, and Brit, it's easy because, you know, they might even start off, like I said, with best of intentions. Like, oh, we're going to, you know, reach out to this kid who really doesn't have anybody. And he, like I said, he was a beautiful child. It's just a beautiful kid, you know. Um, and I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't know what these people, what they're thinking or how this stuff happens or if it's his eagerness that also makes him seem like a you know, an easy target and his own lack of boundaries, you know, as a, as a survivor of like extreme childhood sexual abuse. Um, the elusive vulture said, I pressed charges against my ex. The boundary erasure started before I even met him. Yeah, exactly. Samantha said, my guess is that any licensed professional would need to take an ethics and the law course every couple of years to renew their license. So they always get a reminder of what's okay, not okay. Exactly. And I just don't think there should ever be a time when anybody's alone with a child ever. I just, you know, you can't assume who is and who's not safe. There always needs to be layers of protection. Um, bye, Samantha. Thanks for stopping in. All right, um, my boyfriend, your boyfriend sounds, sounds nice, and I'll say that about most men. He's, I mean, people have already given me a lot of shit for, like, praising him and saying that, like, whatever. So people can take this however they want. He's, he's just, like, I can't say enough about him. He's so good, and, and that's even just separate of me being in a relationship with him. He's genuinely kind. He's good. And he didn't he didn't deserve like a fraction of the stuff that he went through in his childhood. And this isn't like yeah, I've been with him for like five plus years. It's not like I'm just like in a honeymoon phase with him, you know. He's a good, good, kind person. Okay, so August 2011. Pennsylvania Department of Auditor General Performance Audit of Youth Developmental Center in Newcastle. So let's go through the table of contents. So there's the background info, objective scope, methodology. So first they audited employee injuries. Apparently that was like an issue. What finding one, YDC Newcastle did not take adequate measures to here, let me um hold on. Get myself out of the way. Um, okay, why do you see, here, let me make the, uh, I'm gonna, hold on, let me make this a little bit bigger so that you guys can see. Mm -mm. And like I said, there's, you know, there is proof of this. Like the, I know that there's going to be a time where I can actually name these people. I want to make sure that all the proof together is like airtight. Um, but there is, the, the, like I said, because they try to maintain a relationship like after he left. <clears throat> and there's like correspondence. There's a lot. Uh, okay, so finding one. Why does he Newcastle did not take adequate measures to maximize employee safety and thus minimize employee injuries and the attendant 6.7 million in costs. Audit results, student resident abuse. Finding two, YDC Newcastle provided the, the required training for abuse investigators and direct care staff. So I guess that they did what they were supposed to there. Finding three, YDC Newcastle's abuse investigations and reports were not always timely or comprehensive. Meaning that they, like, when there was a report of abuse, they did not document it quickly. Which means, as we know, it's it's crucial that things get put down in writing immediately so that details don't get muddled, things don't get missed, and that an investigation can happen quickly. That's a tactic to try to fuck up an investigation, is to, like, make sure it's slow. That's why they call it the for first 48. Because the first 48 hours after a murder is the best shot you have of solving a case. After that, stuff gets mixed around. Stuff get, it get Things get all spread out. It's a lot harder to pin down facts. So if you take uh, an allegation of abuse seriously, you go immediately and get right on it. If you're trying to muddle it, you're going to go slow. And 
the motivation that these people have to cover up for each other is the fact that this was a very small community out in western Pennsylvania and they employed 500 residents of this small community meaning this was a big employer of the local community if anyone is from a small town or has ever lived in a small town I'm from a big area but we used to go down and I used to go visit family down in South Jersey and it was a very small town everyone knew each other Everyone was connected in some way. Even when we would get pulled over by the police, they always would be like, oh, hey, Pat, hey, Brett. Everyone knew each other. So what happens is when you have an industry that, that employs the majority of a community or, or a large portion of the community, it's all friends. It's friends. It's cousins. It's relatives. It's neighbors. People have their own little, you know, alliances or people have their own drama or whatever. But if it's a neighbor and they have, you have to come and report abuse to somebody and that's that person's friend or that's that person who's like, well, you know, I know their kids or I know their husband or I, you know, yeah, I don't want to see them go down. That's what happens. When this place went down in 2013, they, all these people were like, you know, protesting the decision to shut it down. They're like, oh, this is so important for the community. This this youth, basically juvenile detention center. We depend on it for our livelihoods. And then the people are like having reunions and stuff. And like, oh, it was, you know, just to reminisce on when we all worked at the YDC, you know, back when we used to like, you know, abuse kids because they were having a mental health episode. Aha, like, cool. It's fucking weird. So that is why I believe that a lot of this stuff was fucked up and muddled because if there was abuse happening, it was lax standards, and they were a lot of, like, protecting each other. Orwell's uh, house cat said, Some studies have shown that people working in the care sector experience compassion fatigue and often, often develop dark triad traits over time. And that's exactly, I think that that's what it is because it's like, well, why does this happen? Is it because it's, attracting dark people I don't think so and I think that that's what makes it harder for when abuse does happen because a lot of people are like oh Jerry you're saying Jerry was diddling I, I don't know I can't see Jerry doing that I've known Jerry my whole life no yeah you you now and also another thing you gotta understand these are troubled children these were children who came from broken families you know what the first thing that the woman, oh, I wish I could play the, I really wish I could play the uh, phone call. But what the one woman said when I like asked her if she remembered my boyfriend, I didn't say who I was. I just started, was like, yeah, I'm trying to get some information about some stuff. And like just started asking questions and she started answering them. And I said, do you remember his name? And she said, yes, I do. And then immediately, and then I said, you know, do you remember? And I mentioned the other woman's name that he had a sexual relationship with. She goes, I, I think I do. I said, are you aware that, you know, there is allegations that she had a sexual uh, relationship with um, my boyfriend? She goes, oh, no, I didn't hear that. And I said, oh, okay, interesting. And then I was like, um, are you aware that, you know, there are some, allegations that you I don't know I didn't say are you where I said have you ever had a sexual relationship with him I just only I phrased it all in questions and then she was like and then immediately was like oh you know yeah he, he was a very uh, troubled child uh he you know had a very very difficult home life and you know he immediately launched into like discrediting him basically like you know and again they bank on the fact that these kids you know some of them have juvenile um, criminal records and if anybody watched the other video that I did about um, about him and he talked about how he was groomed by like adults in the street who were using him to like sell drugs and stuff so like men who I even know I still know these guys to this day because he has like a whole it's like a weird thing because he still has like a relationship he's like he still sees one of them as like a father figure because he's like you know he took me in at a time where I didn't have anybody and like yeah he's like but that's just how it was down there like kids just you know teenage boys get involved in like the drug trade it's just what it is 
Um, you know, I see it as grooming and it is, you know, you should know better, but like the men, the guys would always, the adults were always like, oh, you'll just get a slap on the wrist. You'll just go to, you know, do a little couple months at the youth to center, center or whatever. It'll be fine. So it's just sad that like then that's used to discredit him even further, right? And it's used to discredit these kids in general. Same thing with my girlfriend who lives with me. You know, she has like a history of, I guess, shoplifting or, you know, theft or something. And then it's like now she's not credible. Oh, you know, she's just a... Or they're on like a, a lot of these kids. I think it's some like 95% of kids in the foster care system are on some sort of psych psychotropic medication whether they need it or not, and it's to calm them down, it's to keep them manageable, you know, keep them from dealing with hard emotions. Um, Trinity of Fire, best laid intentions, a lot of social workers get into that career to heal their own stuff, absolutely, be like, oh, I want to take care of the kid, you know, be for the kids that I wish somebody was for me. Warwell's house cat says, well done, well done, you, for bravely supporting him and processing your own healing, too. Sending love and care. Thank you so much. And take care. Thank you. Um, Shinobu Kuchow says, Your boyfriend really seems like a wonderful person and a wonderful man. Even as a hardcore rad fan, I do believe there are high-quality men out there. I know my father was one of them, and Hakim is too. Yeah, my dad was great, too. My dad was really great, too. And they get along really well. Like, Hakim and my dad are, like, super close. Um, and my dad to this day is a wonderful grandfather, like my, of everybody in my life, other than Hakeem, like my dad is like my biggest lifeline. Um, you know, my mom is to some extent too, but it's really my dad. And I've always had good men in my life, always, you know, and even though he's like, Hakeem's been through some stuff, I, he's, he's always been there for us, like in, in like <laughs> every way. Um, okay, so then let's see. The next finding is, um, okay, where is it? All right, finding four, why do you see Newcastle did not effectively address repeated allegations of abuse? Again, because I think that there was a lot of relationships. Audit results, staff qualifications. Finding five, why do you see Newcastle did not always comply with FBI clearance requirements? So FBI clear to work with children, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm sure this is with anywhere else, you basically have to go through a federal background check. And they, so they're not performing appropriate background checks. So they basically could be hiring somebody who has a history of supplying alcohol to a child, or buying cigarettes for a child, or... You know, somebody who has substance abuse issues actively or somebody who has a history of lying on, you know, anything. I mean, all of this stuff, like, when you're dealing with the most vulnerable amongst us. Oh, my God, it was so gross, too, hearing one of the women when I called her. She's like, oh, I remember him. Yeah, you know, he was... Um, you know, he had a real tough life. He was like, she was like telling me about him, like as if I don't already know. I just had to like bite my tongue. She's like, yeah, he had a real tough life. Yeah, I remember him. First she tried to claim she didn't remember him. She's like, oh, I don't, I don't know. And I was like, stop it, stop it, stop it. I'm like, but like, I just was like, um, you know, and I just kind of launched into like, oh, and she's like, okay, no, I, I do remember him actually. Yes, he was a, oh, he was, he was a real nice kid. He, he had a tough life real tough life uh you know and i i he was a he was a nice kid he was a very smart kid he's really smart like despite having like virtually no education or like just normal life growing up he's really intelligent i think just like a high iq kind of just person she's naturally intelligent she's like he was very very smart she's like you know i just but he just seemed like oh he's just you know, going through a lot, and I wanted to, I tried to be a positive role model for him. I just wanted to be like, oh, so, like, did that include performing fellatio on him? Is that, like, your normal strategy for dealing with at-risk youth? Like, you know, is that something they teach you in, like, the weekend training course? No, because, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't work in that industry. Maybe giving head is a part of, like, the rehabilitation strategy. I just didn't know. You know, just interesting. I, I never heard of that. 
Uh, little cat face says being close knit can definitely be a negative. Yeah, it can. Because then it's, it's just not objective. Little cat feet says everyone feels sorry for kids who suffer sexual abuse until they develop behavioral problems. But where do those problems come from? Exactly. Exactly. And these were kids that just were not. Simp like they're, it's hard. These are kids that were, were like not easy to empathize with because they didn't look like little babies and little kids. You know, they had behavioral problems. A lot of them had mental health issues from a lifetime of abuse. You know, and it's like, and it just, it's such an easy target. All right, so, let's see. Finding six, YDC Newcastle provided the required trainings to new hires whose records were sampled. So that's a good thing. Finding seven, YDC Newcastle employed properly licensed nurses. That's a good thing. Finding eight, YDC Newcastle promoted qualified personnel to supervisory positions. Auto results staffing levels. Finding nine, YDC Newcastle did not consistently maintain, maintain its supervisor logbooks. Uh, finding 10, YDC Newcastle schedules did not maximize supervisory cover during waking hours for the periods that we sampled. Exactly. So basically there was not enough supervision of what was going on during waking hours. And from the stories that he told me, that much is very, very clear. Um, I'll real quick tell you, you know, I want to go through some of what he said happened. Um, you know, it just seems like there was a lot of activity and a lot of freedom because they try to get freedom to kids. It's not like a prison, you know, they want the kids to have like, you know, a sense of normalcy to be able to develop and feel normal. Or says it's not in the training. I have a parent that's worked at Title I schools and God knows how long, not in Texas at least. No, I, 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 no, I know that Felicia is not in the training. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite that crazy yet, even though, you know, the world is getting a little demented. Um, let's see. He said... Um... So he also had gotten, like, I guess, abused. Like, they were had, like, really, like, hardcore restraining techniques. Um, let's see. He goes, oh, so I tried to tell him how, like, she was, like, denying. He goes, oh, my God, she can't deny anything. We had sex in her office coat closet, the office next door. To her office, the office next door to our office. Also, my family knows she was dealing with me. And then he names which family knows. She also had sex with me in the bathroom next to her office. She wore a jean skirt so she could be fast and explained how it would be fast access and shit. I know the whole layout of her brother's house. She couldn't take me to her house because of her mother and father. So she like lived with her like older parents. Uh, so she had a brother who apparently works for the city. And he's like a gay man who works for the city. And she used to be able to, she used to take him back to her brother's house to have sex. And I guess because the kids could go on little like excursions, like go and like buy little supplies if they were supervised. And because these women were given so much leeway and, and just like, you know, they, they were the ones to supervise, so they would take him, like, you know, for day trips and stuff like that to go pick up supplies. So many kids I know who are abused were abused by other kids. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, he said that there was a lot of that going on. He said a lot of the boys abused, like, the younger boys. It was always the older kids abusing the younger kids. Um, they had, like, access. The boys and girls interacted with each other to a certain extent. I'm not sure how. I know that there was, like, a wing for, like, juvenile sex offenders. Um, I really, really want to, like, get him on here to, like, talk about it. See, so he said, um, oh, and then, she, oh, so when I called her on the phone, she basically was like, oh, was he part of the janitorial staff? And he goes, I wasn't part of no fucking staff. I was allowed to come, I was not allowed to come home like the staff. The staff had custody of me in a youth development center. Was that part of her development strategy? Um, he said, we had sex on the floor for office adjoining office. It all started when she got a massage from me in her office chair. And see, that's what I think it was. 
he's like he's kind of fresh and I feel like as a kid he probably was like again he probably didn't have good boundaries you know because he was a victim of like very young childhood sexual abuse he's you know he's a kid who's he probably did have like sexual feelings and stuff like that just because a child has sexual feelings towards you or is trying to see what boundaries they can push you have a responsibility to shut it down um you know and I guess he was also just always looking you know just no human contact in these places kids need human contact and so he like I guess offered to like give her a massage and he said that she um what does it say? So we had sex on her floor office, adjoining office. It all started when she got a massage from me in her office chair. He said she grabbed me by the pants and gave me oral. My pants were had an elastic waistband. Her phone number was, and he said her phone number, and it's still the same number. Um, he remembered it off the top of his head. How would he know that? Uh, he yeah, he just said, how would I know her personal phone number? Because he, he's like has a really good memory for like certain things. He said, tell her. Uh, you know all about the middle bedroom at Danny's house. Uh, I don't want to say who it is. At her brother's house and in, in where his brother's house is, her brother's house is. The back porch we would sit on. How do I know all of that? She admits she admitted that she remembers me and justified a bunch of shit saying because I had um, like a janitorial position. I guess as he was like older, he was able to like do run like errands and do little stuff like that. Um, he said, wow, that's sick. Um, he goes, this is, this must be how young girls feel when they finally approach their rapist groomers from their childhood. He goes, I have met family members that will write sworn statements when this goes to court, if we have to go that far. Um, oh, and then he was talking about the other one. He said, I went to a hotel in blank in Newcastle with her once. My friend blank knows the truth. Her name is Blank. She's a longtime resident of Newcastle. She used to tell me how crazy that was. I just didn't think it was that serious when I was young. And that's what he told me. I remember when he first told me this story like years ago. I like I was the one who kind of like like got him thinking about the fact that it was bad for him. He would kind of like laughed it off as if it was like, and I was like, Dale, don't you feel like that's affected you? You know, and we, like, talked about it and just over time. And then, like, you know, he kind of, like, got emotional as he was just kind of really started to open up about stuff. And he kind of said that he feels like it really did have a negative impact on him. And he really didn't want to have sexual relationships with them. And it was, like, kind of overwhelming. And he couldn't focus on other things like making friends and just being a kid because he always wanted his attention. And, you know, he was like, I thought it was cool because they would like, one of them would bring me alcohol and like they would buy me stuff. But like, he's like, I really wish it didn't happen. I wish it didn't happen. And he's like, I just thought that I wasn't a victim because I was like, as I was a boy, I thought that, you know, if I'm a man, then it's, and I, he's like, I felt like I participated in it. So I didn't feel like I had the right to call myself a victim. Um, mm -mm. let's see. Matilda says, if I had a student who would constantly flirt with me, he was 16 and pretty neglected by his mom, who, by the way, was born the same year I was. I would have never acted on trying to be cute. Exactly. Kids are going to do that. They're going to project that sort of stuff, especially kids who are survivors of sexual abuse are going to have inappropriate boundaries. It is your responsibility as an adult to set those boundaries because he didn't want a sexual relationship with them. That wasn't really the point. He just thought he his understanding of the woman who abused him was his stepmother. His stepmother was sexually abused. It was just when he was like he like not she didn't she was just doing like weird things. And and it, or not his stepmother. I think it was like his dad's girlfriend or something like that. And then this other guy when he was young. And I believe that he associated like affection with like sexual like intimacy, you know, and kids who don't understand the difference between healthy boundaries, healthy intimacy, normal love. The only intimacy he ever really had with women was sex or anybody with sex, right? 
because he didn't have a loving relationship with his mother. His mother was addicted to crack cocaine. So the only sort of physical intimacy you ever had, that's why I say it's so important to hug children and hug boys. Studies show the little boys are not hugged as much as little girls are. They're not given the same amount of physical affection. And so boys start to look for affection. Every child, every human being needs physical affection. And if somebody doesn't get it, What's the next easiest excuse to have somebody want to just hold you and be, you know, breast to breast with you and, and touch you and look at you? It's, it's sex. And sometimes people aren't actually looking for sex, especially kids aren't actually looking for sex. They're looking for affection. They're looking for human contact. They're looking for touch. They're looking for love. And it's, and it's hard, again, as a kid who's in a situation like this and, and who's being raised by people who, who are employees of the state, you know, where he can't get hugged and held and, and touched and loved. The next easiest logical thing, the only way he ever got physical intimacy was through sex. And I think that that's what happens. Um... Bang and Shun says, me and your man have similar stories. Listen, I want anybody who wants to come and talk about experiences like this, you know, anonymously or otherwise, like I, I would love to hear it. Lucid Vulture said, um, kids internalize the sexual abuse and don't know what healthy relationships interactions are. I really believe, yeah, I really believe that that's what happened with him. I really think that as a kid, he didn't know. You know, he was like, even just even in my own experiences with him, it was like, I don't know. He would like try to like do too much and I was like, just slow down, <laughs> you know? And then I read like, he was kind of like, I'm actually really glad you said that. Um, he's like, yeah, you're right. Like, good. You know, I, I feel like he just always was like, even as a man, he was very like sexually objectified. He has a really nice body. And I say that because he's just always been, like, objectified. And, like, I think even as he got older and he got, like, confident, you could tell that it, it, women don't just deal with this. He also saw a lot of his self-worth connected to his, like, sexuality. And, like, you know, and he's had, like, and he ended up, like, dating a lot of women who were, like, way older than him and stuff. And I, I feel like a lot of it was just just fucked up understanding of like what intimacy is and like searching for an intimacy that he should have had that should have been wholesome as a child but wasn't uh, little cat feet her little cat feet says predators play a long game and will spend years getting qualifications to work with kids months to years grooming the kids as a woman i don't understand how women can be part of that i agree and i think it's different with women because again men are looking for like a quick Fuck. Like, they want to just fuck you once or twice, right? With women, it was a very, like, emotional dependency, it sounded like they had on him. They wanted to, like, tell him about their problems. The one woman was, like, complaining about her husband and saying that she wasn't getting enough, like, intimacy with him. And being like, you're better at sex than my husband. And, like... You know, and he would talk to her and like the way he is with me, I just know how he is with me. And I can only imagine he was that way in some way. He'll, he'll like, his favorite thing is just, just lay on you and like, you know, just, he loves and I just listen to him and just let him talk to me and stuff, you know. And I feel like these women feel like, oh, they have this, like, and he's like, he is, he's really smart and he was mature. So it was like, they, they are starting to have this like emotional relationship with them. These women who are not getting attention from their husbands or their boyfriends. And these women were not very attractive and it. I'm sorry, but that does matter. It does matter. They weren't, you know, you know that they weren't getting attention from, from people in their real lives. Men weren't checking for these women. They were like, I'm not, I'm not trying to objectify them as women, but the fact of the matter is it's like they now have this like good looking younger kid who's like so emotionally dependent on them and is giving them the attention that they so desperately wanted, you know, and they don't have the dignity or the the wherewithal to, to know that that just because he looks older doesn't mean he is older and just because he's giving you attention doesn't mean you accept it like that. And you will still keep the boundary down. You're the adult. Period. 
Yeah, dystopian deed ties it creepy. It is creepy. Laura says, occasionally I check in with her now ex-husband. He didn't even know. She used to tell us stories of how in love she was with her husband during this. The manipulation was insane. When we say, it says, Horace said, my middle school, then high school gym teacher and health teacher in high school groomed and molested a girl on a sports team. She followed her to high school. We all had no idea. Oh, when I was in high school, well, the music teacher was having sex with my, like, childhood friend all four years. And it blew up her senior year. And he, like, did, pr he was in prison. Is on, like, Megan's Law now. How'd I hurt my voice? I don't know. I've been really sick just with a lot of things. I think I've like, I have fluid in my lungs and I think that's part of it. Okay. Um, why DC Newcastle did not provide the supervisory coverage? Oh, we talked about that. However, oh, supervisory coverage required by Department of Public Welfare regulations for child residential and day treatment facilities. And that's a big deal. You're not monitoring what's going on. Why do you see Newcastle establish effective employee complaints systems? So for the employees, of course. General expenses. Um, Newcastle expenditures were consistent with the facility's mission, food services. They adequately controlled its food. Pay incentives, we don't care. All right, so <clears throat> background information. It says... Uh, Department of Public Welfare offer of chill. I'm so hot, you guys. I'm sorry. I'm going to open up a window. I have, like, the worst hot flashes. I, like, I haven't been taking my estrogen because i got to get it refilled. Hot flashes are the worst. Um, Pennsylvania, okay, the Department of Public Welfare, I'm going to read this last thing and then i got to get going and we'll continue this. Um, youth Families and Bureau of Juvenile Justice Services. The Youth Development Center Youth Forestry Camp System was originally established in 1959 under the authority of the Department of Public Welfare. The Office of Children, Youth, and Families was established in 1980 as a distinct office within the Department of Public Welfare at a time. At the time of this audit, fell under the Deputy Secretary for Children, Youth, and Families. The responsibilities of the office <clears throat> include child welfare services, the operation of youth developmental development centers, and youth forestry camps. That's what my girlfriend who lives with me did, the youth forestry thing. That's where she said she was like sucking. We were like laughing about it. She was like, yeah, I just figured out if I can like just suck dick, like I can get out of doing it not funny but we're just like trashy but like she was like yeah I found out early I just like suck some dick and like I won't have to like do all the like activities and stuff and the guy used to let me ride on this like cart rather than walk she's like I wasn't doing no fucking camping oh my god I have to have her on the stream she like we're like really funny together but I um, know it's not funny at all it's horrifying we just sometimes you have to laugh because it's it's just sad. Otherwise, it literally makes me want to cry. Um, but that's like the program that she was involved in. Uh, and child daycare services. Pennsylvania's child welfare system is county administered and state supervised. County children and youth agencies and county juvenile probation officers organize, manage, and deliver child welfare and juvenile justice services. What's really fucked up about this, and this just hit me, is he was housed out in western Pennsylvania. He's from southeast Pennsylvania. He's from Philadelphia. Why would you take a child and move him across the state? Yeah, his family was, like, not the greatest, but he did have some family. He did have an aunts and stuff who would have checked in on him. That's so inappropriate to take a child and move him across the state and house him far away from all of his family of origin. So that, like, I, and they didn't have the means to go out and travel out to West. I'm sure he never, I'll bet you anything he never got not one visit. Not one. I'll bet you anything. That's just not appropriate. You can't take kids that far. Even, even the, um, the federal system is, uh, that was one of the changes that Trump made uh, in his criminal justice reform and his prison reform bill was that you can no longer take 
federal inmates and move them all around the country. You've got to try to keep them at least in a reasonable distance from their family of origin so that they can maintain contact and so that there's not undue burden on the family to be able to visit. And it should try to just try to keep families together. Um, let's see. I know. My voice is fucked. I'm, I'm drinking. I have um, ginger and lemon and honey. So many predators embed themselves in those systems for access to kids. Sometimes you have to last. Otherwise, you're like, you have to. Like we were, we, we go once a week, we go to the pool together, the indoor pool, and we sit in the hot tub and we use the um, sauna and we will do like a little lap together, but it's like a bullshit lap and we take up the whole way <laughs> and we just chit chat the whole time. And so like, everyone's like doing like serious laps. We're just like doggy paddling and like laughing about stuff. And we were just like talking. She was like telling me about it. And we were laughing like the whole time. And it's like... It probably would sound so fucked up because the stuff we were laughing about was like horrible. It was like her like childhood sex abuse, but it's like I had fucked up shit happen to me too. Like I said, I had this. I was fifteen. I had like this forty five year old. Like he used to be so fucking weird. And he used to take me to the mall and like buy me stuff and like tell me to like dress up for him. And oh god, he always wanted to see me in my like. I, it was just fucked up. So what was I doing? What was he doing? It was in the head um try not to get pneumonia I know I can't sit too long uh let me just finish reading this and then the department of public welfare established by the bureau of children state bureau of state children and youth programs within the office of children youth and families in 1988 my birth year Bureau of State Children and Youth Programs became the Bureau of Juvenile Justice Services in 2009. The Bureau was responsible for the management, operations, program planning, and oversight of the Youth Development Center, Youth Forestry Camp facilities. These facilities are designed to provide state-of-the-art treatment, care, and custody service to Pennsylvania's most at-risk youth. Oh, Lord. Um... The youth entrusted to those facilities are male and female adolescents who have been adjudicated delinquent by the county judicial system. According to the website for the Bureau of Juvenile Justice Services, its treatment services value strong child, family, and community partnerships, as well as promote competency, development, and victim awareness. The Bureau employs a restorative justice concept, which emphasizes the Facility programs provide equal attention to the victim, the youth, and the community. Um, it is so YDC Newcastle is located in Lawrence County, approximately 50 miles north of Pittsburgh. So this is Western Pennsylvania. YDC Newcastle provides secure programming, including both educational and rehabilitative for adjudicated delinquent males. The facility's campus encompasses 206 acres. On June 30th, 2009, YDC Newcastle's treatment program consisted of a 62-bed residential compound and 126-bed secure treatment component. The following schedule uh, represents selected unaudited YDC Newcastle operating data for the fiscal years and in June 30th, 2007, and June 30th, 2008, June 30th, 2009. That was like right before when he was there. So anyway, um, so just what I'm, like I said, what I'm going to do is really try to use the YDC Newcastle as like a case study to look at what happens in state facilities, how this stuff gets missed, how, you know, how this stuff gets swept under the rug, what happens how we can maybe like try to identify this sort of stuff and you know protect against it give people a chance to um tell their stories and then even just for a personal just a personal project that i want to do to bring some closure to somebody that i really care about a lot that, like, I just feel like he's never had anybody, like, stand up for him. And he's, like, stood up for me a lot. And has, like, been there for me a lot. 
you know, it's like I was like I couldn't. He and I are five months apart. He's five months older than me. And it's like I always think, like, I couldn't stand up for you back then. But, like, I can do something now. Because he always says the same thing. You know, this one guy he, who, like, sexually abused him when he was really little. He always says, you know, I just always think, like, yeah, I couldn't protect myself back then. But I'm grown up now. You know, I can protect myself now. And I can protect my family now. And I can protect my kids now. And I can protect you guys now. And that's how I feel. It's like, you know, it's the one thing, like, that I love about being an adult. Not so easy to take advantage of anymore. You know, and that's what I said to the one woman. I was like, listen, I know that, you know, maybe Hakeem is uneducated, socially disenfranchised. But you know what? That's why we work so well together. Because guess what? I am educated. And I'm not socially disenfranchised. And I will see this to its conclusion. And I will be his, I will have his back. You know, and it's like you banked on no one ever taking him seriously. You banked on no one ever listening or caring. Well, justice will come late, but it will come. Uh, pornography is a more, uh, form of mind control. And I think that a lot of women are watching pornography. I think that that's why we're seeing more women getting into, you know, male pattern, sexual behavior. Um, I think that women are, are also just getting into, like, the hypnosis. The internet, I think, really opened so many doors. The pedo is becoming mainstream. It's Pandora's box. I agree. Still need to make that video using sissy hypno porn as a case study. Please do. You should look into the Hershey School. Yeah, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, just from people in general. So I'm going to keep going through this. I'm going to... There's a lot of stuff that I want to explore with this, but um, I want to use this as a case study. And I want to find a way to bring justice and closure to him. And at least just send the message that, like, that, like, he mattered. And, you know, that it wasn't okay. And that he's still impacted by stuff and that you're not you know that it's no longer his cross to bear it's now their burden I want him to transfer the burden off him and put it back where it rightfully belongs put it on them so that we can just move on from that just the shittiness of it all all right guys thank you so much Kale Dine is great yeah she is Thanks so much for being here with me. Thanks for listening. Like I said, I'm mean, this is we'll we'll get into the rest of this audit, figure out what the hell was going on, and I'm gonna do some like deep dives. I'm gonna dig for stories. I'm gonna dig for previous kids who lived there. We're gonna I'm really gonna pick this place apart so we can learn how this happens, and like I said, just use it as a case study. But um, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate. It. I gotta get going. I'll see you later. Sorry for my voice. Bye.